Good afternoon. A story about a 10 year old girl. She was at her mother's table and she was icing her cake, helping her out. Her mother walks towards her and she looks at her icing the cake and she wonders that this girl is doing a really good job. Maybe I should give her a pat on the back and tell her would she like to do something more. So she asks her, do you want to join me in the kitchen? And do you want to learn something new? The little, the little girl looks up at her mother and she smiles. You could see her eyes gleaming, wanting to learn more. And that 10 year old girl was me. And that was the beginning of my story. But before I tell you more about myself, it's very important to know about the Parsis. I am a Parsi, born and brought up in Delhi. Very rare, very unique, because most of the Parsis are known to be in Bombay. The Parsi community comes from the religion which is known as Zoroastrianism. And Zoroastrianism is one of the oldest religions in the world. We started in Iran with our prophet Zarathustra and our protector Ahura Mazda. These were the two things that brought the community together and worshipped the sacred fire. We believe in protecting our fire. Uh, later, when we were in Iran, it was plundered and ruined by Alexander the Great. That is when the Parsis wanted to protect their community, their religion, and they had to fled. They fled from Persepolis to the port of Sanjan, which is in Gujarat, by ships. They fled because they were desperate. They couldn't stay in anymore in Iran, and they were being converted into being Muslims. When they reached the port of Sanjan, and folklore teaches us that the king then, Jadav Rana, he looked at those big Iranian burly men, and he said that, you know, I'm not going to let you enter. You're foreigners, and you might ruin my land. So the, folk, the folklore states that there was a priest, the head priest, who got a bowl of milk, and he sprinkled some sugar over it. And what he meant by that, because obviously their languages were different, what he meant by that was, like in milk, when we add a little bit of sugar, you sweeten it. The same way we'll enter your land, we will not plunder, we will not ruin, but we'll actually make it flourish. And that's exactly what the Pisces did. This was some 1,500 years back. And that's how the name came, which was basically Paris plus I, which is people from Persia. And that's what we were known for. And from then onwards, the journey has just been endless. And we've moved forward with the community. We speak a sweeter version of Gujarati. We've learned the Gujarati way of wearing a sari. We've adopted so many customs from Hindus, but we've also integrated it with the Iranian customs. The most important thing about cuisine is that it comes from a place. Cuisine, cultures, communities, religion, all of them are interlinked. Anyone who studied sociology, anthropology, and read about it would know that cuisine and food is something that your world, at least people, revolve around. Over a table, you'll have conversations. There'll be food, there'll be laughter, there'll be fun. And the Parsi people are known to be pulling each other's legs. They love it, also eating chicken legs. But um, it's, it's literally their comfort meal, a bava peg, which is a Parsi peg, like this big five finger spread, big whiskey drink. And you want chicken with that. And you can see there's a Parsi man really happy. You can see his eyes. So um, they're known for their good food and their love for alcohol. They have a good time. They believe that if you're living life, live it king size, enjoy yourself, have fun. And in a Parsi home, you'll see that really funny picture, but that's exactly how we are. We make fun of ourselves. We love it. And um, in a house, you'll always, so if my mother's cooking something, someone from the back would probably come, pull her leg, drop something, do something purposely to just irritate her, and there'll be lots of screaming and shouting happening. But that's how it is, and that's how they like it to be. Uh, so moving on to the number of Parsis in India. Sadly, however much fun we wa might want to have, but the numbers are dwindling. There are 1,38,000 in the world, which is incredibly low and one of the tiniest communities. And in India, it's only 69,000. So what do I have to say for a community which is so small in size, majorly resides in Bombay and Gujarat? And sadly, in Delhi, we're only 300. You're lucky that you have one of them standing in front of you. But uh, so it's, it's a very small community. We're very proud of it. And even Gandhiji said that, you know, it might be a very small community, but in contribution, we're extremely great. We do believe in a lot of charity, and we do believe in a lot of communal gatherings. 
Moving on to food, which is the most important topic that I want to talk to you about. A little introduction, a few things. Eggs, supremely important for a Parsi person. One meal has to have eggs. I had a boiled egg for breakfast, so I'm not even saying no to that. But um, it's something that's known as, uh, for it, it, it's a symbol of prosperity and fertility. It's known, it's supposed to be important because you actually take an egg, you, you turn it around, you know, you pour, put it over a person's head and it's supposed to ward off evil and then you break it, not on the person's head but on the side. But that's what you do with a coconut in Hindu religious ceremonies. So we took on that tradition but we added an egg to it which makes it a lot more fun, I think. Um, so why have I got two dishes of egg? A bit maybe because there's another story with eggs which is about leftovers. My grandmother was one of the few very, uh, few very um, small group of Parsis who were vegetarian. And in vegetarians, egg was the only sort of protein that they had. So whatever leftover vegetables they would have, the next day they would put it into a pan and break eggs on top of it. And that's, why, that's how the saying came, when in doubt, break an egg on it. Um, so they used to have things like bheja paridu, which is practically like masale da brain and eggs on top of it. You break it, you bake it, and it's supposed to be delicious. Some of you might not like it. Um, but there are different versions of it. Like you've got leftover sabzi, they put it into a pan, they break eggs on it, they again have it as a meal. Um, soiled wafers, you'd probably put that again in a pan and have it. So eggs played a very, very important role. Now moving on from Iran, we left and we came to the port of Gujarat. And obviously that's where the Iranians suddenly saw fertile soil, lots of greenery, banana trees, um, fish, uh, and uh, spices, which is what India was known for. So for the Iranians, when they left Iran, a very dry, their meals were very dry. They had rice and meats and bread, which was all very dry. So they came here and they suddenly were like put into an experimental kitchen. So for them, I'm talking 15 years, uh, 1500 years back, it was, uh, it was uh, a time for them to sort of reinvent their cuisine. They had the deliciousness of Iran, the, the kind of things that they learned in Iran, and they mixed it with Gujarati cuisine. And obviously they're super selfish and wanted to learn more and eat more, so they learned from the Anglo-Indians, they took from them, they learned from the Maharashtrians and the Goans, and that's when you, know, you would call Parsi cuisine a wholesome cuisine, because it's a mix of five cuisines. And this is a very famous dish of Patrani Machi. Another very, very mouth-watering dish, which is Sali Boti. You can see the potato mat sticks on top. It's a skill to make, but they want crispy. They want spicy, they want salty, they want sweetness. And all of these things add to the flavor of the dish. An akuri, which is a scrambled egg, super simple, but again, they want it to be a lot more spicier, and they like to eat it with bread, another breakfast staple. Uh, more dishes which mix with uh, the flavors of Iran and Gujarat. This is a dish which has apricots in it. So you'd have apricots and dry fruits which were primarily used in Iran, were now taken and got because they got some things with them and then they obviously went back to their relatives to get more ingredients. Um, this is a dish called Jardalu Mamalgi, which is basically uh, apricots and chicken stewed together, which is delicious. Coming to this dish, which is very, very important, the most popular Parsi dish, uh, which is known as dhansak. The origins of dhansak come from a dish called khareste esfahan. Um, it's an Iranian uh, stew which is made with lentils and meats and vegetables. But obviously when you come to India, you just want to spice it up more and that's what we're famous uh, for doing. So that's the traditional dhansak, but now what we know of it, earlier it was a lot more rustic. And obviously the Parsis can't end a meal without anything sweet. So they have to have a custard and this skill they learned from the Britishers because they worked very closely with the Britishers. So they learned a lot of skill of baking, or the, the French bit of cookery, souffles, pies, things like that from the Britishers. That's a, a, a Parsi thali which you might find at wedding feasts or navjots. You must have not seen something like this because we're more used to eating on a patta um, in traditional settings. Moving on to masalas. Every kitchen and every uh, cuisine would have their base masalas. And masalas form a very important part. In Parsi homes, there are two primary masalas. One is a dhansak masala and one is a sambar masala. A blend of 15 spices and mostly made at home and cooked in, so the masala is kind of cooked in garlic and oil. Moving on to a few images of traditional Parsi cooking. 
earlier it was done in um, a charcoal uh, stove so you had charcoal underneath and you had charcoal on top which actually made your oven so there was heat from the top and heat from the bottom and it cooked at the same time it was just not heat from the bottom and obviously wood fired um, cholas or stoves which gave food a more flavorful um, uh, I mean it was more flavorful and more tasty and uh, obviously it was slower methods of cooking what you might see in the center is a picture of our gods and because we worship fire we do a prayer before we cook bringing and coming from all the kitchens of the world and all the kitchens of the Farsis to my story my mother is my main inspiration she's the head of the family and she cooks she plans all the meals and um, coming back to that 10 year old my mother was the first person who actually saw me and said that okay this girl is interested in cooking and it's just not a girly thing to do she might want to take it up as a profession and um, that's when I uh, looked at it a little bit I probably researched about it when I was 14 15 and I said that not too many women it's all male dominated am I sure that I want to enter such a field and um, I took that step very supportive parents and Farsis always believe in raising the boy and the girl in the same way so they actually pushed me forward and they said you know why don't you go ahead and do a course in culinary arts if that's what you want to do so I did go to IHM Aurangabad and I did study culinary arts there I did very, very well and um, like many of you over here uh, I was also someone who wanted to be in the trend wanted to copy the West and I was like okay well, Indian food is just dal chawal and you know I don't want to get into all of that I'd rather be in the pretty pretty bits of French pastry and cooking and and that's when I decided that I wanted to go to Le Cordon Bleu which is in London and uh, while working there and learning so much about French techniques and French um, methods of cooking there was uh, this moment of realization for me and this day which sort of um, I would say was a day that I realized that what is it that I really want to do um, French cuisine was something that it was just a trend or was I actually doing it because I felt it but I felt that um, there was a certain day where I cooked I call it the pork chop story so it's a day where I cooked pork chops and it was beautiful it looked absolutely perfect and we have to take it back home so you pack it up and you take it back to your accommodation where you're staying and that was my dinner and I open it I look at it and I'm like oh my god dry pieces of meat a sauce which is thick and buttery I want something masalidar like an Indian craves for something masalidar so I took the pork chops washed off everything made a vindalu masala put the pork into the vindalu masala took a bowl once it was cooked sat down dunked my bread into it it was so satisfying I can't tell you how that was the moment when I realized that there's so much goodness in Indian cuisine there's so much so many things that we just sort of you know it's at the back of your heads and you just want to follow a trend and it, it was it was when realization hit me and you know it was like okay maybe this is not what you want to do but it's great you've learned the techniques you spend lakhs of rupees of your parents they're going to kill you so you better stick on and you better finish your course so I came back and that's when we thought of the concept of soda bottle opnawala which was to revive a dying cuisine um, with soda bottle opnawala obviously at the age of 23 I was the head chef thrown absolutely into the deep end of the pool had one year of experience had no idea how to manage 16 uh, men who were my team uh, mates and I had to boss them around quite literally they never learned and they would question me and there would be sexist remarks and you're too weak you're a girl can you handle it can you handle long hours can you put in that much effort um, as much a man can it's labor intensive there was even a question saying that do you know Hindi I'm born and brought up in Delhi obviously I know Hindi uh, so anyway very high pressure and the first three months made me almost cry um, every other day but it didn't stop me because that is exactly what I wanted to do I wanted to push myself further and like you might see you want to break barriers you want to dedicate you want lots of passion in your work you want to you know you want your hard work to shine and um, that's just a picture of me being a boss with my team but now we've got uh, 17 uh, I mean now we've got 17 people in our team I try and get more and more women into the team but most of them run away a different story but um, now we've got seven restaurants and I'm really happy that we're sort of making progress in reviving a dying cuisine plus we're also breaking barriers by having a female chef and I'm happy to lead it for more other women for more women who want to get inspired and join the field and not think that it's only a male dominated industry you have women 
who are handling your kitchens at home all over the country. They have the flavor, but why can't they run professional kitchens? And um, I think that's what was my main motto, and that's why I've really, really stuck around with Soda Bottle in sort of reviving the cuisine and also putting my point across to the audience. Um, try to make it as much as an Irani cafe so that you feel nostalgic when you enter. It's an era which is long dying. There were 500 cafes, now there are only 25. And um, so all of this sort of comes together. And what do I want to tell you? What do I want to, you know, what do I want you to be left behind and how do I want to inspire you? Um, certain things in my life which um, I mean, I'm only 26 and I mean, I've got a long way to go. But whatever I've learned from, from then till now was number one, if you feel something, you want to go for it. Number two, you have people who back you up and if they help you out, I think you'll, you'll even have, so you have a, a bigger and a better circle of friends, family, whoever might want to push you. Thirdly, I think it's also something that you have to strongly feel about. And that's what my topic is. You want to feel that, you know, where are your roots? Are they just, are you just looking around or are you following a trend? Are you aping the West? Or are you actually looking within you and saying that this is what I really want to do and this is what I really want to show and this is what I really want to prove? And because of the number dying out and the community being really small, I really want to keep this tradition alive for as many years as I can. And because of that, I'm writing a book and researching about it and traveling to towns, talking to people, spending time with 80-year-olds. They're like my best friends because they have all the time in the world and they want to teach me and they want to talk to me about Parsi cuisine and recipes. And um, so, I mean, it's been a journey. And what I want to leave you behind with is a quote by Rumi, which says, maybe you're looking into the branches and you should look into your roots and see where you go. Thank you so much.